right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Today, we have a very special guest, special show um, for folks who usually come here for political discussion. We, I'm sure we will talk some politics, but we are here to talk, which is why I'm dressed the way that I am, uh, um, about a book that at least ostensibly is about basketball, and we'll get into that as well. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, the basic things, of course, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're not, support us on Patreon if you appreciate the work that we do, um, and uh, share, you know, get on social media, share this so we get some more folks in here to enjoy um, this conversation. So our guest today is Hanif Abdurraqib. Um, I'm sure folks are here for him, and so they they know who he is, but I'll just say quickly, he's a poet an essayist and cultural critic from Columbus, Ohio. Um, he has won a lot of awards, had a lot of recognition. I won't name them all. I will say that being on Millennials Are Killing Capitalism, this is just an empirical fact. It increases your likelihood of winning the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. We have at least three, maybe four recipients that have been on and... I think all of them, except maybe one, received the reward at the award after being on Millennials or Killing Capitalism. So I'm, I'm not taking credit, of course, but I'm just saying that's that's just a fact. So, um, anyways, some of his books, which I recommend people get all of them. Um, a Little Devil in America was his most most recent one before his last one. Although I think he may have a children's book. I'm going to ask him about that. Um, they can't kill us until they kill us. Um, go ahead in the rain notes to a tribe called quest um, the crown ain't worth much a fortune for your disaster um, and the new one that we'll be talking about um, which is there's always this year on basketball and asc ascension and i'll just say like i mean i really love hanif's work i really do um, we don't have a lot of conversations with people who write um for a more mainstream audience for more you know thinking more about pop culture and sports and things like that and there's a reason why that we don't do a lot of those conversations but hanif is somebody that i love to have discussions with um for a variety of reasons and we can get into that too um but um yeah so th th i've said enough i'm gonna welcome hanif to the stage hanif welcome to the show thank you it's always good to be here i appreciate it who who other than me and Fred, who are the other MacArthur folks? So I think Kianga Yamada Taylor mm -hmm. got one maybe in the most recent mm -hmm. round. Um, oh, the stupid thumbs up thing. I got to fix that. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure. It, I'm I'm trying to remember if Saidia Hartman has one. I don't know that she yeah. has. And she probably yeah. she probably preceded us having her on if she did. Uh, but anyway, um, you well, know. It at least gets you down to like a a, a one percent chance or something like that, which is definitely better than you know the rest of the population. So right, no, it's dope to be um, here as always. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Yeah, and I didn't finish my thought, but um, I do really, I really enjoyed this book. Um, it's as I sort of alluded to. Obviously, it's kind of ostensibly about basketball, but you know we could argue that's not at all about basketball. Um, yeah. Or it's it's about basketball as a as a vessel to talk about a lot of other things. Um, and I guess just to start, like as a kind of you know to kind of cursory get into this discussion, maybe say a little bit about where the idea of this book came from, and you know how you how you kind of started to formulate what you wanted to do here. Yeah, well, I mean, in 2017, or maybe 2018, after They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us came out, I really wanted to write a book about Ohio in the age of LeBron James. LeBron and I are around the same age. Uh, we grew up playing basketball with varied successes uh, at the same time in Columbus, or in, in Ohio. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a kind of, you know, I think for folks who were not young during that time like teenagers or maybe younger during lebron's high school run there's a i think there's an absence of reporting and analytical critical but joyful uh remembrance of that time from someone who was in that era so much of the lebron 
high school, early Cav stuff is um, done through the lens of people who came to Ohio. And, and that stuff is great. I mean, the late, the late great Grant Wall, who obviously is, um, you know, I talk about a lot, is someone who I admired and, and respected deeply. He wrote maybe the definitive piece on LeBron in high school. He came here for, with SI and spent time with his family. But if you weren't living here, you know, I think there's a different experience. So I thought I was going to be writing a book uh, about LeBron James in the age of this elder millennial age of Columbus and Ohio broadly. But, um, you know, I didn't, I realized I didn't really know how to write that book. And I needed to write other books to teach me how to write this book. And then when I went to write this book, this thing had happened in 2020, maybe 2021, but I think it was 2020, late 2020, because it was um, lockdown-ish or, you know, some of us were locked down and some of us were doing whatever the fuck. <laughs> um, and um, LeBron was at home and hadn't, I, this had to be 2020, maybe before the bubble actually, because when LeBron's on TV and knows he's on TV, I think he like maybe dyes his beard, which I'm not passing judgment on. I'm just saying to build a bridge to this thought. And during lockdown, he definitely wasn't because there was this video of him at home playing like video games with Bronny or something. And his beard was like really gray. And I remember seeing this and thinking and being kind of jarred because so much of the conversation around LeBron James is about immortality and just this kind of he will live forever as he is as a basketball player as a successful basketball player um you know someone who just crossed the forty thousand point threshold like this weekend i think um and it was kind of jarring to see this really stark representation of his like actual material aging and i was maybe talking to a homie of mine who was who was around my age i was like damn you know lebron starting to look a little old and he was like yeah but i mean if he's if he's getting older then we also are getting older and so I, the book changed. The book became about time and mortality and uh, in some ways, grace and forgiveness, I think. Um, and in a lot of ways about who defines what making it out of a place is. There was a homie of mine who the real engine of this book, the thing that really put a battery in it was um, a homie of mine who was down for a bid, got out. And before I went to go pick him up from the precinct, his mom was like, you know, he's for East Side, like me, East Columbus guy. And his mom pulled me aside and she's like, you know, I would love it if, you know, he didn't come back to this neighborhood. He can stay with me for a bit, but I would love it if we got him out of this neighborhood because, you know, a lot of trouble for him out here, all that, all that. And I, you know, I was like, all right, well, you know, I'll talk to him. And on the way, on the drive back, you know, um, he was out at the Marion facility. So that's about an hour from Columbus. And so on the drive back, I was talking to him like, you know, like, what can we do? You know what I mean? Like, I, I got you. I can get you set up if you want. Yeah, I get you an apartment. Like, on the north side, I can get you any, you know, and he said this thing to me that was really poignant to me because I, you know, I, I was echoing his mother's concerns. I was like, you know, moms wants you out the hood, <clears throat> you know. Um, and he said this thing to me that was like, I'm not leaving here. You know, like we as young people, we dreamed this neighborhood and we built it and we made it so that it, no one on the outside can come in and touch it. Like we cannot be fucked with in this area that we built as ours. And if you know, he said this thing that is always going to ring ring in my ear. It was like, if they if them if the people come get me, they got to come get me from East Columbus. They got to come get me from here, this place that I love. And to me, that that defined what the book was attempting to do: asking what is what is making it, what isn't making it. And I felt kind of ashamed. You know, I felt betrayed, like I was betraying his impulse to even ask him to to live somewhere else. Like I live in East Columbus. I live in the neighborhood I grew up. You know what I mean? Like, and I made that a point. I was like. If I buy a house in Columbus, it's going to be in, on the east side of Columbus. So who am I to tell someone you can't go back to? And I, I of course, love and respect to to elders and, and concerns of our parents, you know, but but that was really poignant for me. And it, it made the book a lot more. Um, I wanted to clarify the question of what is making it and who defines what making it is. Yeah, I appreciate that. It, in my head is this clip and I was trying to place it as you're talking about this. And I actually think it's from A River Runs Through It, which is one of my father's favorite movies that we watched a lot growing up. And there's something he's like, no, I'll never leave Montana, Montana, brother. Like, you yeah. know, something like that. Like, yeah. I think it's Brad Pitt's character says that. Yep. Anyway, um, I want to say, first of all, to 
just shout out to all of the students and to Walt at uh, English 130 at Queens College for tuning in. Um, much appreciated. Um, yeah, no, and and I think that's, I think you've already laid out a lot of what I felt in terms of, of reading it. I mean, um, you know, it's a deep conversation about place, about, um, you know, nostalgia, and we can get into that too. Um, but also like about, um, yeah, just what you just, just laid out in that story. I mean, that story makes a lot of sense in relation to, to where you go in the book. Um, and I guess one of the things I would say is similar um, as a question is that there's ways that this book reminds me a lot of your approach in Go Ahead in the Rain or mm -hmm. in A Little Devil in America in that, you know, on one level, it's about something, you know, it's about basketball in Ohio basically is kind of the the topic, I guess, or, or the, you know, a theme throughout it. Um, but you're exploring all of these, obviously the tribe book was about tribe, but it was also about, you know, your family and growing up and all kinds of stuff. And, um, uh, little devil in America, you know, is about black performance, but it's, a, the book is about many other things as well. Um, and so I guess what I'd say is, and maybe it's similar in terms of your answer is, like how, how have you figured out your elevator pitch to this book? Like how, how would you describe it to somebody in terms of somebody <laughs> who asks you, so what's this book about Hanif? Yeah, well, it's different. It's, I mean, people who write things or have to kind of um, sell things to a corporation, perhaps understand that there's two different, you know, Random House, the way I had to sell this to them, because I didn't have, a, I didn't even know how to describe this book to my editors. Um, at Random House, who are who are great, you know, and I will say this: um, I've never put out a book with the side. They're doing the um, trash pickups behind my house. That's a little loud for a minute, but um, there's um, I didn't know how to describe this book to my editors, but they kind of trusted me. This is the first time I've had a book on the same press ever, and so there's a there's a continuity. I have the same editors, same publicity team, same all that, and so there was a level of, we saw, you know, I didn't really know how to describe Little Devil in America either, or at least the way I described Little Devil in America was not the way that it came out. Um, this book was similar. I just came to them, I think the only material thing that I had was the He Got Game essay. Um, and I think that was truly, it may be the begin, a part of the beginning about LeBron's hair. But I, And I went to them and I told them, but I actually don't think the book is going to be like this. Like this is, you know, I think these are two small parts of what the book can be, but I don't, think the book is going to be this way and that is that was putting a lot of trust in myself that um the arc of the book would reveal itself to me as i got to the work of it that's kind of my approach before i write uh when i'm in book mode i'm really rigorous about the shit i'm, I'm like three thousand words a day four days a week for two and a half months but before that i do this thing called draft 0.5 where i kind of free write about 30 to 40 to fifty thousand words 30 to fifty thousand words um because that's kind of teaching me, you know, our dreaming is limitless, you know, really, but our abilities have limits. And so that kind of half draft is teaching me how long the bridge is gonna be between my dreaming and my limitations, which for this book was really urgent because I had dreamed it for so long. And so in terms of the elevator pitch, I had to say, I have this material text, I have this He Got Game essay, and I have this thing that I've been mulling over about LeBron's hair. But then when I sat down to write it, I had to convince myself that in order to elevate those things, I had to make them secondary. I had to look at that He Got Game essay, for example, and say, how, how have I not shown grace to my father in my work, right? I had to look at the LeBron, that little bits of LeBron's hair thing and ask myself, have I actually confronted fear of aging? Because I think I talk about and speak a lot about having gratitude for having survived. Um, and I sometimes think, for me, as someone who I've talked about on the show, I talk about a lot, who legitimately and very literally did not think I was going to live past the age of 25, like did not, you know, um, not to jar anyone listening, but of course, like made exit plans for that time in my life, did not have a plan for day, day one after day 25. And 
to have survived the worst impulses of yourself um, many times over in my case, or to survive a dissatisfaction with a world that is not tenable for people to live in. Um, I think people imagine that there is only gratitude that comes with that. And I do feel grateful, though I am, of course, still dissatisfied with the world as currently constructed. I do feel grateful to be in community with and in solidarity with people who um, allow me to keep moving forward despite that, trying to build a collective world that is more effective, all of that. But also what comes with that is like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. You know, I didn't expect to age 15 years after 25. And so every, it feels like I'm stealing time, which is a, a sort of bewildering thing. Um, and so the book had to kind of capture that too, but that's harder to sell. You know, you can't, it's harder to walk into a, a publisher's office and be like, well, this, yeah, this is about basketball, but it's also about how I, I, you know, did not want to be alive for a long time. And it's also about how my relationship with my father ever complicated has evolved because I am now at an age where I understand him differently and see him more clearly. And it's also about how time is slipping away from us all. And, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to tell a publisher, well, I think this is going to be about basketball. Um, and the rest is the work that I, you have to convince yourself as a writer. You have to convince yourself that aboutness is a myth. It's always, it's all a myth. There's no, yeah, you got to sell a thing. Sure. I get it. Um, but what happens between what happens in a, in the office of an editor is different than what happens when it's you and the page. And when it's you and the page, you have a responsibility to go beyond what you say on an elevator, you know, and that's, and that's hard to do. At least for me, that's hard to do because. I could have easily just settled into this shit and been like, basketball book, let's go. You know, I could write about the 2016 NBA finals for, you know, 20,000 words. But would that be useful? Would that be effective? Would that be, for me too, would that be furthering my body of work in a good way? Yeah. And I mean, I want to say that too, because like I've read like basketball books at certainly at a certain point in my life was like my genre. Yeah. Right. Like it was like, you know, I went through a phase, you know, where I was like, OK, I want to read the Jordan rules. I want to read Bird's biography. I want to read Spike Lee's best seat in the house. Like I want to mm -hmm. read, you know, and um, a lot of those books, I mean, Spike Lee's books is a little different, but a lot of the books are very much, you know, like about the game in, in kind of concrete ways. And then like, you know, maybe a little bit about practice, a little bit about what likes going on in people's lives and how they approach things and whatnot. I mean, obviously granted those are, you know, either about players or written by players, et cetera. That's a specific thing, but there's a lot of most basketball books I would hazard to say are really about basketball as like, the fundamental focus of them and they actually track teams right through certain periods and players and stuff like that through certain periods. Whereas this one has moments like you'll, you'll, you'll look at um, teams for a specific period of time, or, you know, you will talk about finals, you know, you talk about obviously LeBron through different phases of his career. Um, but it's not really like there's never a point in the book where you're like, OK, so the fourth quarter, like this is what happens and this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> yeah. You know, and um, and I think that honestly, um, I mean, it's a much better book because of that. You know, it's certainly more you, but it but it also um, I, I found it really the thing I appreciated is that you're so interested in. Um, the kind of effective, affective aspects of the game and of how we relate to it and what it means to watch it with your friends and what it means to watch it with your friends. Like in the case of LeBron, you know, and this is an interesting aspect of the book to me um, because you're a Minnesota Timberwolves fan. And so there was a part of me who thought, this book is going to be about how every year at the beginning of the year, you're like 82 and oh, which yeah, this year yeah. is closer to reality than it has ever been. Sure. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and it's not that at all. Like there's, there's actually, I don't even think the Timberwolves are mentioned in the book, but, um, no. but that'll be for another project. Yeah. But anyway, um, it's very much about, yeah, about Ohio and basketball and a lot of different experiences with that. Um, 
So I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but I, I, I do yeah. have another question we can pivot to afterwards, but go ahead. I do actually, because I'm glad you said that because the first draft of the book was a lot of just beat by beat basketball recounting. I, I owe a massive debt to my editors, Maya Millet and Ben Greenberg. And again, like having that continuity of working with editors, um, you know, a little of America, we also figured it out, but on this book, we just like, it was like, we were locked in from the jump because we just knew, we know each other. We know how we communicate in Maya. You know, there were points of the book in the first draft where I was straight up being like in the fourth quarter, Kyrie Irving dribbled down, you know, and, you know, Maya was like, I think that you're doing this. She called it a authoritative sports voice. Um, and she's like, you're doing this when you're actually afraid to confront something else. And so the actual, you know, so in some of these sections, for, for example, where I'm talking very intimately about being unhoused or being incarcerated or some of these sections where I'm kind of mirroring myself alongside my father. I was using basketball, not even as a metaphor, but as an escape, you know? Um, so many of the basketball sections were so much longer. And it required an editor who I trust looking at me and saying, what are you running from here? You're actually running from something and providing us with information we actually don't need. No one's gonna read this book looking for beat by beat game summaries of the 2016 NBA finals, you know? And it, and I wasn't even aware that I was doing it. You know, it was one of those things where in the draft phase, it is sometimes hard to identify what you're running from. This is why good editors are important and editors who are not afraid to tell you that you are writing scared. You know what I mean? Um, because the minute Maya said that, I was like, oh, shit, you're right. You know what I mean? I could just see what became very fluorescent for me on the page. And um, so the book was that for for a while. And then I, I thankfully deconstructed it and asked myself some real questions about, you know, do I want to be comfortable or do I want to write the best book I can write at this stage of my life? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's beautiful. And I, I, I you know, I'm glad the editor pushed. I think that was the right the right push. Um, so I want to talk about the Fab Five. So yeah. th this is one of the ways that the book kind of starts out. Um, and, um, you know, the I grew up just for people who are listening. I think we've established this on prior discussions, but I'm a couple years ahead of you. You were, I think, one year behind LeBron um, in school. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, growing up, the Fab Five was one of the first not the first, but one of the first college basketball teams that I fell in love with. And um, my father didn't like them. You know, my father was, my father was, um, well, to give folks, you know, we'll get into it, but in the 92 finals, NCAA finals, they play against Duke. And my yeah. father rooted for Duke in that game. And Duke crushed them. Yeah. And this is one of the few, this is one of the earliest moments I remember you know, crying and being furious at my father. Um, but buried beneath that was this whole subtext. And, you know, it's like this is one of the tricky parts about um, this, about what you're doing in this book is that, um, you know, I think for my dad, right, he was nostalgic probably for something that he thought was not represented by the Fab Five, right? He was probably nostalgic for, players who played for four years for um, a continuity with, you know, college franchises over time with um, obviously the Fab Five were, you know, totally a group of players who encompassed like the hip hop generation, if we can say that, you know, the Black Sox, the bald heads, you know, especially by the second year. Um, and that was something, I mean, my peers and I, love that right like it was like all of us who were playing basketball in middle school like we all dressed like them we all looked up to them we all decided which one of the fab five we were was we were playing etc yeah. um and anyways this was a real like um not deep right but it was a fracture like between my dad and i and it also is why like i'm playing against him in our fantasy basketball league this week for the finals and i hope that i still win right and part right. of that comes yeah. from losing that kind of game as a kid you know and like wanting to get you know my my revenge in fantasy hoops but um <laughs> there's this you know you dedicate this um 
and say anyone who did not love this team was my enemy, right? And, um, you know, I think we could just quick. Hello, my enemies. May you have a very, very, very bad day. Uh, bring in Ali Mortada to, to, to summarize. Um, yeah. But yeah, so so anyways, talk about this a little bit from your perspective and, and kind of what you were doing here. I will say real quick, uh, you know, shout outs and solidarity to Ali Mortada. It's so funny that um, every time I see that kind of uh, that intro of his, uh, I, I'm kind of delighted because because this book, the first part of this book, and I think a thread that runs through it is a deconstruction of what an enemy is and what an enemy is into whom, you know, to whom an enemy, how we can expand the definition of enemy to a, as a collective term, you know, and yes, there's some political motivations there, but it's also kind of playful in the book. Um, the, the, the root of it is political. Um, because of course, from a political organizing standpoint, it is important to identify one, who an enemy of freedom, justice, solidarity is, but also to what degree that enemy can be loved and perhaps turned towards one's efforts. You know, I don't believe all enemies are are beyond saving. I also, and I, I can't because to someone undoubtedly, I may be an enemy that they are hoping to save. So that's it, yeah. But um, the Fab Five were were so vital to me. I was fortunate and remain fortunate that I think I grew up. You know, I grew up in a very uh, very black neighborhood that was not entirely neglected, but not really beloved by the city it was in. And um, I was very lucky that you know I, I didn't. There was not a dearth of affection being shown by black men. Um, my father was affectionate towards towards my my brothers and I. My friends' parents were, you know, the, the fathers were affectionate. But I will say the Fab Five were the first Black men I saw showing affection to each other without any literal familial bond or familial bond in a quote unquote traditional form. And they were also maybe the first young Black men I show I saw, you know, where it was kind of like 19, 20 year olds. They just, if you watch videos of them and see photos of them, they're always hugging each other. They're always touching each other. Um, you know, Chris Webber would kiss Jalen Rose on the head. These things that were, I I loved that, and I I didn't. I was so young when they were, when they were in their run. I had such a hard time understanding how, in some ways, these kind of affections were coded as violent or dangerous. And I, I do that thing in the book where I kind of deconstruct the handshake, the, the black folks giving each other handshakes, secret secret coded handshakes, or even gang signs, um, as something that injects fear in the enemy who does not, who cannot possibly look upon these things and see that these are tools of affection to build a language for your people that only they can translate is a mode of affection. Um, and so the Fab Five were important for me because it was me saying, oh, these, the love they have for each other scares these white folks. You know what I mean? Um, and that to me, you know, and I say this in the book and I think I've said this out loud many times, the function, if you are from an area that was governed at least in some part by gangs, you know what I mean? Or any kind of crew, if you want to expand the definition of gang, it's not just about what, how the neighborhood lives. It's also, that's a defining line of who gets to stay, who gets to stay in, who got to stay the fuck out, you know? And so that, you know, the Fab Five for, for, were speaking a language, they were decoding a language that I understood and that everyone I loved understood. And they were saying, if you don't understand this, you just got to stay the fuck away, you know, and we'll be all right. And so I, I do get, you know, you had that, the great thought about your father disliking them, which I don't necessarily think, you know, I would, I would, guess I don't want to speak for him so maybe I shouldn't say this but I, I feel like my father probably didn't like them you know and so there was I think a racial divide with the Fab Five but there was also a stark generational divide um and we still see that now right there's something that I really deeply value I know that um you know in the questions you said you talked about like being like shaking a fist at a cloud and being that kind of elder and I get it I really do like I um 
I work, I have to work really hard to, well, I guess I'll say this. I do writing workshops with, with like, you know, seven to nine young Columbus City Schools students every year, completely voluntary. We, we meet up um, one Sunday a month. We workshop each other's poems. They workshop my poems with the same, they're required to workshop my poems with the same rigor that I workshop their poems with. So if I come in with some bullshit, they they will tell me straight up, like, this is some bullshit. And we know you can do better, you know? And the reason I do that is because I'm not a teacher. I'm not a parent. I'm not someone who's in an assumed position of power. Therefore, there's no hierarchy in this room. We're all writers. And I do it too because there are concerns that they have that are best understood through the lenses of the things they're passionate about. And so I really fight, I think so many elders, elder millennials, the gen, what's it, yeah, older people than millennials, what is it, Gen X? I don't know. Um, I'm bad at the generational whatever, but um, who are striving to either dismiss the things that young people love, or they try to love the things that young people love by way of ingratiating themselves with young people or so that young people will think they're cool. I'm not interested in young people thinking I'm cool but I am interested in a cross-generational solidarity. And the way that cross-generational solidarity is built is through trust. And I think the way one way trust is built is by engaging with people who are younger than you, who have a different lens on the world due to the generation they're coming up in and saying, I would like to understand what you're passionate about. I don't even need to love it, but if it will aid me in being in community with you, then I want to understand it. And if it will aid me in building trust with you, then I want to understand it. I I can't, I was lucky in that I had elders in my community when I was young who were also interested in that kind of cross-generational solidarity because there's going to come a time and we are in a time always, but I think especially right now where young people are being radicalized at a rate that is beautiful to see. And it's also it would be too quick for me to keep up with if I were invested in the kind of material displeasures of their pop culture diets. You know what I mean? I need to understand that. And I want to understand that. And I want to exchange things. I want to operate, you know, in this kind of um, writing group, we exchange playlists, we exchange, you know, recommendations, we exchange these type things because um, there is going to come a time and we are in it right now where our camaraderie in the community that we built is just going to make us stronger against fronts that would rather we not be in the streets, rather we not be occupying City Hall, would rather we not, you know. um, If I'm not to, (laughs) I almost said to quote Bubba Sparks, which I guess this is a Bubba Sparks quote, but the the, the, they can't arrest us all, right? I I don't, um, you know, Bubba Sparks, don't worry about the law, they can't arrest us all. That is, he meant that in a very literal sense, but, I, I think about it in an overarching, overarching sense of um, they cannot restrain or detain. Um, you know, power cannot erase all of our thoughts, energies, actions if we have a diverse set of thoughts, energies, and actions. And that requires multi generational solidarity. I, I know I'm going on and on, and you asked about the Fab Five. I'm sorry, but, but you're fine. You're fine. There, are, there are like elders who I still love and see in the streets who were my elders when I was a teenager. Those were my OGs, you know? And I had OGs on the basketball court. I had OGs in the library. I had OGs on political fronts, you know what I mean? And so it's going to take all of that. And um, and sometimes those worlds intersected, but sometimes they didn't. The OGs on the basketball court might not have been at the, you know, the marches in the streets or whatever, but that's cool. You know, like you 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 get what you need from And I don't really think of myself as a community elder, but it actually doesn't matter how I think of myself. It matters how I make myself available to a generation who is both consuming a lot of information at at an unprecedented rate, being radicalized that I think, I don't wanna say unprecedented rate. I mean, I think there was a, a mass radicalization in the 70s but perhaps this is an unprecedented rate just because of the amount of information that that generation has access to. And I think eager to create things at an unprecedented rate. And I can't fulfill all of that, but I can say like, you know, I would like to build, a, to create a building block with you that relies in part on me saying, yeah, I might not love 21 Savage, but I'm interested in what you like about 21 Savage, or I might not love, you know, so, you know, 
a great example of this is one of the young folks was was loving the all-star game to, to make this a basketball parallel you know we did our little workshop and one of the homies was like oh, all-star game was fun it was he, he was hype on the all-star game and it it took a lot for me to not be like man that shit was garbage you know what i mean like i watched that shit <laughs> right. but if i did that right you know what i mean like i would see the the excitement drain from that person and it's not even on me to, to even offer a corrective for me it's like what you like about it you know what i mean like let's watch some and not just what did you like about it what did you like about it and like let's go watch some highlights that you know that give you this same kind of feeling you know and, and so that's important to me too that the kind of bridge building that comes with um cross solidarity cross-generational solidarity can be built through pop culture consumption i really believe that i really believe that i'm committed to that not only pop culture consumption obviously like you know but but that is a building block no i agree i mean i think it was um michael simmons in we did a four-part discussion with uh him and zohara simmons on their book with dan berger um which mm -hmm. you you we wrote a blurb for um Love that book. yeah it's a great book but um you know he said something about like you know a lot of my leftist friends have their critiques of football and baseball and basketball and he said if you want to organize working class people, you got to watch that shit because you you have to be able to have conversations with them, you know, um, and uh, that's an entry point, you know, um, and I'll just I had pulled this up actually in preparation for um, today. Let me see if I can make mm -hmm. it a little bit bigger. Um, I, know that it's, I just yeah. saw this. I just saw this on Twitter. Yes. Is like yesterday. Um, yeah. But it was my favorite Lenin anecdote is when he visited an art college and saw the weirdo avant avant garde futurist shit they were doing and he was like well i don't get it but at least they're having fun i'm old this is from <laughs> alex orloff and um yeah i mean that's what he says basically at the bottom is like he he goes to this school obviously this is after the revolution so early soviet union and they've created a school um that was emphasized art uh you know and this the students are all working on futurism and avant-garde stuff and he's it's like he wholly didn't approve of it expressing concern over the connection between the students art and politics after the discussion lennon was accepting and steady stating well tastes differ and i am an old man you know and uh <laughs> i thought this kind of encapsulates um in some ways like an approach that i really i think i respect a lot from you and yeah i mean i did have a a part of the question where I do wrestle with this myself because I am often the old man shaking his fist at the cloud. Like yeah. I am often the person who, um, you know, is complaining about the music of people under 35 or <laughs> complaining about, um, you know, the ways that I wish that they would bring back hand checking and we could have 80 point basketball games again. And, you know, all of these things. Um, and I recognize that, you know, that that is actually a reactionary impulse, but it's also tied to something that you say, um, which you say, um, isn't it funny the links our enemies will go to in order to say, I am afraid of being left behind and then who will love me? And I think that that is, it is, a, it is related to a fear of my own obsolescence. And it is also related, I mean, one of the tricky things, and you you call nostalgia a hustler in the book, um, but I think one of the tricky things is that part of nostalgia is just a yearning for stuff that you really loved, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a it's a yearning for these these moments where you felt so alive and felt like there was such beauty in something from your past, and of course, as you point out, like nostalgia doesn't deal with you know all the things that you hated about that period in your life, you know, um, it, for me, middle school was a very tough time. High school was a very tough time. Um, and yet I still have a tremendous amount of really deep, positive memories and associations with that period of time in my life too. Um, and thinking back, I remember those a lot more than I do focusing on the kids who bullied me or whatever else it was, you know? Um, yeah. but, um, yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to bring that, that quote of yours back in and to think of, but that is the challenge of it too, is like, um, and, and it's also with my kids, you know, I, I have to push myself cause I have a 15 year old and I have a six year old and I have to push myself 
to say, you know what, like they're deeply interested in something. And even though like I never liked anime, like perhaps I will need to like tamp that down a little bit so that I'm not raining on their parade all the time. Um, but at the same time, like they love it in spite of me too. So that's another yeah. aspect of it as well. <laughs> I mean, I think all the time, I, I sometimes think um, to even attempt to reach for the way that someone else sees the world is a massive act of affection. I love the album, the Beach Boys album, Pet Sounds. And I love the making of the Beach Boys album, Pet Sounds. It was called, uh, I don't know if you know this, people watching know this. It was called Pet Sounds because Brian Wilson was very literally hearing the world differently, you know, due to an accident. His ears were just literally wired differently. So he was hearing sounds that no other human could hear, really. And if you listen to the Pet Sounds sessions, which is the like behind the scenes making of the Pet Sounds, particularly the making of God Only Knows, which took like a day, full day, you, what you hear is Brian Wilson trying to articulate how he's hearing the sounds in his head to some of the best session, session musicians in the world at the time, Carol Kay, you know, Hal Blaine, all these folks who, who could play anything. And they're having such a hard time in the beginning understand he's making these noises that are like that sound like various bird calls and shit like that and they're all kind of like okay we'll try to get here with you we'll try it. and then as the day goes on you can tell that they just surrender themselves to they surrender their desire to fully know and are driven instead by an impulse that is something like love that says I want to get to this place with you. And so I don't actually need to be an expert in what you're presenting to me. I'm just going to follow you. I will try to follow that sound in the best possible way I can to the, my highest capabilities. And I think there's something about that which calls to me that says, I am, I really want to know how to love people well. I really do. That's, I think, maybe at this stage of my life, my defining trait is that I desire to love people well, or I'm curious at the very least, um, if not how to love people well, how to be the best possible community member or comrade or these kind of things. And that requires, I think, intent to intent listening and sacrifice and surrender, surrendering myself to what I don't know so that I might, and being satisfied with that not knowing if it means that I get to really revel in the curiosity and the unknown that might allow me to learn how to love a person well. Because I also, I mean, another thing that I came to terms to it with with writing this book was my hope is that I have not yet loved everyone I can possibly love, right? My hope is that there are people I have not yet encountered who I, I can love well. And I don't want to numb the part of me that is open and eager to love people well. And I don't want to betray the people who are no longer here, who I loved, who, who built the capacity for love that I have. I don't want to betray them by not nourishing that through curiosity. Because I know myself, I know that if I did not nourish that, that capacity would grow stagnant. It would not get any deeper. And I am really, um, one of my biggest fears is that I lose the capacity to love. And that capacity to love is fueled by curiosity that says, I actually don't need to fully understand what you are offering to me. But the fact that you are offering it, I have gratitude for. And through that offering, I really want to just make a map uh, of your affections and then lay the map of your affections over the map of my affections and see where we might intersect. Right on. Brooke, before you call in, decide to go to work or call in sick, I'm going to ask a question that relates to something that you've said to me before, um, which is, um, so Brooke uses this term, and I think I'm correct on this, Brooke, I'm sorry if I mess it up, but you talk about combat effectiveness where you're at. And he, he, he talks about, Brooke's from Oakland, and um, you know, he's like any, uh, you know, I might get displaced right from here. I mean, this is yeah. a discussion about gentrification, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, but anywhere that I would move 
would reduce my combat effectiveness greatly. And I mean, yep. he's thinking about this as an organizer, um, but he's also thinking about it as somebody who knows um, the terrain, who knows the ins and outs, knows the places, knows the people, knows, you know. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with Brooke, which is uh, I've said that, you know, I've moved a lot in my adulthood. Um, I grew up in Southern Oregon, um, which is a difficult place that I have um, some emotional and, you know, childhood attachments to, but I also have a lot of <laughs> um, criticisms and challenges with it um, and the political, yeah. uh, social aspects of the place, the cultural aspects of the place, the people there. Um, so it's, but, but there's no doubt in my mind that had I stayed there that, um, I mean, I still know it better than, um, any place that I have lived and I've lived in, you know, Maine, New York, Philly, DC. Um, and you know, and so there, there's a, just, there's a real, a reality that I've lost quite a bit by, um, by the moves and there are, I'm happy with where I am now. I feel good because my kids are rooted in a place and I want them to have that experience. I think that was part of what shifted me from this place of I used to love to move because it was yeah. a new experience yeah. and new people and new places. And it was like really exciting in certain ways. Um, and you could have a little bit of a process of reinvention because you could say, well, I'm going to leave behind the aspects of myself that um, I now recognize are not my best traits or aspects and move into a better version of myself is sort of the way that, you know, I think in my mind it worked. Um, but the problem was that you lose every time that you move, um, you're losing a huge part of yourself, but a, a huge part of the knowledge that, for instance, for organizing would make you effective at it, but also um, just so many connections and so much, you know, knowledge. And so, you talk about this in the book, definitely with respect to Columbus. I mean, you know, we've talked before about, um, you know, your period of houselessness and stuff like that. And so I don't need you to, I mean, it's up to you how much you want to go into that. But I think that the, um, that aspect of sort of combat effectiveness um, is something that I see come through in, in your book as well. I don't know if you want to yeah, talk about that at all. For sure. I mean, I mean, very literally there's the, there's the part, I think there's actually made it, there's a, uh... Yeah, it made it in the book where I talk about running from running from cops in cops who don't know the neighborhood, who sur who surveil it and brutalize it, but don't know it. And perhaps through not knowing it feel well, I mean, they would feel entitled to brutalize it because they are occupying force. But 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 like that lack of knowing, I think, enhances the brutalization. But when I was a kid and even in, in my teens and early 20s. It didn't matter if the, if the cops chased you because you knew the terrain. And you see that, you could see that manifested through Columbus folks, even during while we were in the streets in 2020, specifically. There are alleyways, there are corners, there are things that people know. There's institutional knowledge that's aligned with the geography that makes you untouchable to, a, to an occupying force who does not view the geography with any kind of affection or care or thoughtfulness, right? And so it didn't matter if you were getting chased. There's also the part in the book, you know, there's sometimes in, in my books where um, I kind of just want to tell a, jo a joke. You know, in Little Devil in America, there's that Rachel Dolezal joke that I really wanted to tell and I kind of shoehorned it in. And then there, in this book, there's that thing about calling the cops pigs using a biblical reference that I really just wanted. I like early in the book's draft, I was like, I really want to make that joke. And I didn't yet have the length. You know, I was just like, I got to force this in somehow because I think this is funny to me. It won't be funny to everyone or anyone maybe, but it's funny to me. Um, but um, so that that's one part of combat, effect, combat effectiveness from an organizational standpoint. But another part of it, too, is having a literal spiritual connection with a place that asks more of your organizational capacity. Right. My desire is that people who live in Columbus. Who. Uh, have at least the opportunity to love it as much as I have. The, the, my love is like massively complicated, you know, and I, I, I've worked through that in text and in interviews and all this in my living, you know, my love is massively complicated, but I do have a spiritual connection to this place that almost requires more of me. Sure, if I wanted to, I could just sit in my 
I mean, I don't live in a literal tower, but I could say, I could, you know, I could be like, I've, I've won some things and I've written some things and I am detaching myself from this community or placing myself on, but that's actually not what a spiritual connection asks of us. Especially if we're talking about resisting gentrification through archiving, um, you know, an archiving of work. I, I think about the great Columbus artist, Amina Robinson, who's the art, the greatest artist who's ever lived in, in Columbus by far. And so much of her work, her, her visual art was about archiving the neighborhood she loved because she watched them slowly deteriorate. And sure, you can stand in front of a bulldozer or you can stand, if, you know, you can link arms in front of the bulldozer that is tearing down the community center, but it is going to tear down the community center one way or another. And, and I'm saying this to say that so many people think about gentrification in terms of architecture and structure, but it's an actual spiritual severing. It is my grandmother and her mother and her, and her mother and her mother had this place and now they no longer have this place. So there is a generational severing, which is a spiritual severing. And so how do I or the collective we, uh, be it folks in Columbus or folks were ever attempting to resist these um, I almost call them small, but not small. These um, a bit more concentrated colonial efforts. Uh, if we are to, I mean, I think of gentrification as, as colonial effort. Um, how do we work to archive the spiritual portion of our relationship with a place? A place that place is not a choice you make. It is at, at some point, but it is it is first made for you right? Uh, like you didn't choose Southern Oregon. <laughs> it was chosen for you at first. And then you hit a point where if you have the means and if you have the ability, you can you can choose a place back or you can choose elsewhere and choose many elsewheres. But I think as someone who was chosen to be in Columbus and then at some point as someone who made a definitive choice to choose Columbus back, there's a responsibility because that choosing back comes with a spiritual commitment. Um, and so it's I'm serious about nostalgia in some ways because nostalgia for me just can't act as, oh, the good old days, you know, sure, maybe for like a porch conversation, but I'm attempting to do something more in the material sense with the work, which is a, a, a mode of critical archiving. I don't mind just sitting and shooting the shit with the homies and being like, man, back in the day, we used to do this, this and that, but there's a difference between a porch conversation and a page conversation, you know, and the page conversation is trying in my case to, um, and I'm not, I'm certainly not saying that my writing is a, a form of organizing. I'd, I'd like to be very clear that my organizing is the organizing, you know what I mean? But the writing, the writing serves a, a purpose for me that is to say, I'm trying to rebuild this city as I remember it because it will not be the city that I remember it. And, and you, reader, 20 years down the road, will look upon this city and see nothing that's in my work. And yet my work will exist. And yet Amina Robinson's work will exist. And yet the work of Scott Woods will exist. There's a there's you know institutional spiritual knowledge being built by East Side Columbus residents. And to be in lineage with that means that I have a responsibility that goes beyond kind of um whimsical nostalgia, even though I don't mind whimsical nostalgia at all, <laughs> you know. Yeah, right on. And I just want to say for folks too, like there are very clearly politics in this book um, and they're your politics. They're, you know, they're radical politics. They're more implicit than explicit for most of the book. Um, but, you know, they're embedded in the way that you um, that you do this work. And, and I appreciate that a lot. I think it's um, so. Yeah, I mean, I say that in response to your thing of saying it's not organizing, but um, you know, I do see a political project through a book like this that's about you know, basketball in Ohio and, you know, um, and about your relationship to those things. Right. Um, uh, one of the things, let me see, oh, where do I want to go next? I'm going to go back a little higher in my question. Sorry, folks. Um, so yeah, let's go back to LeBron for a minute. Um, yeah. because, um, you know, you, as you said in the beginning, you have a different vantage point for discussion on LeBron than most of the people who have talked about LeBron over the years. Um, most of the people who have written about him, but also most of the conversation that folks have about him. I mean, you know, it. as I'm reading it, you know, at certain points, I'm sort of like 
hmm, like, where's he going with this? And and then I realize, like, as you get into it, like, oh, no, they're very close in age. Yes. And, you know, of course, being from a, um, you know, a significant city in Ohio, I, I don't know the comparison between, you know, Columbus and Cleveland and Cincinnati, et cetera, in terms of size, but, you know, a, a decent sized city in Ohio that of course you would have good basketball teams in your town. Um, of course, LeBron being in high school, you know, his team would come through and that that would be something that would be an event because people knew very early on that LeBron was going to be special. They didn't know exactly how special, but they had a pretty good idea that he was going to be very special. Um, and so he was already getting, you know, ESPN type attention and national attention basically at the beginning of his high school career. Um, and so maybe say a little bit about, um, you know, some of that earlier experience and how you, you know, because, and, and I think it's interesting and we should probably should say like, you don't approach this book as a LeBron fan either. Yeah. You're not, you're not approaching it as somebody who has a great amount of animosity. He's not your enemy in the book or anything like that, but you approach it as somebody who lives in Ohio and he's, a, you know, an important, obviously, you know, we could argue the most, well, it's not really arguable, the most important Ohio basketball player, right? Um, yeah, but, yeah. but, but, you know, um, yeah, so anyways, just, just say a little bit about that. Yeah, it's tricky. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I struggle with LeBron, you know, because um, he's so meaningful to this state, and therefore he's meaningful to me. I can't, I can't deny the, the meaning that it was so wonderful to watch him ascend. I, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. It felt miraculous. And yet, um, I don't know. I'm not someone who looks to athletes or entertainers for trenchant political <laughs> analysis. <laughs> um, and that still, that still doesn't mean that I haven't been like disheartened and disappointed, you know, by... It's, it's one thing to say, like, I don't, I'm not looking to LeBron or anyone in the NBA for political analysis. That doesn't mean that I don't see their some of their political analyses and go, wish it was a little, wish it was a little different, you know? Um, sure, yeah. Um, but, but that doesn't, I mean, it's still very real that, you know, I had never, I grew up in a, in a really concentrated area of basketball greatness in an era of Kenny Gregory, Esteban Weaver, Michael Red, I saw those guys right when I was a kid, when I was like 12, 13. Um, and still seeing LeBron, especially those that freshman and sophomore year at Akron St. Vincent St. Mary, when they were kind of most of their games were still in the tiny SVSM gym. Um, after his junior year, it became a lot different. The, the games got bigger. They moved to bigger venues. But I remember the first time I saw him, and to be, as we mentioned, that whole SCSM team was good. There were, I think, like three Division One players on that team. Uh, you know, Drew Joyce was an incredible point guard, and Romeo Travis was an incredible post player. And yeah, but the thing with LeBron was he just stood out in this way. It felt like everything was happening in slow motion in real life. Everything was happening in slow motion. And that, you know, I write about it in the book. The book opens with it, or the, the first quarter opens with it. That Brookhaven, St. Vincent, St. Mary game um, in Columbus, folks will remember that. I mean, at this point, if you're in Columbus and you even say Brookhaven, St. Vincent, St. Mary, it doesn't matter if you're at the game or not. Everyone remembers it. Kids who weren't even born have heard about that game, you know? And I, I just, there are ways that LeBron's legacy, so much of this book is also considering legacy, and who gets to define legacy? Because I don't think we get to define it for ourselves, um, even in realms that, that operate on pretty strict meritocracies like sports, where someone's legacy can be defined by rings, scoring titles, all these kind of things. Um, I still don't think you get to define it, you know, even in a meritocracy or so-called meritocracy. Um, but in some ways, I'm wrestling with not just LeBron, but also someone like Esteban Weaver, who 
I, at this point, I don't even think it's only Ohio folks. Like basketball folks know Esteban Weaver, but Ohio folks really know Esteban Weaver, someone who was great and legendary and just didn't make it. You know, number one player in the country as a sophomore, and then just didn't make it, didn't even finish high school, you know? There are a lot of those stories all over. I feel like every city can have one, right? But who's to say that Esteban Weaver didn't make it? Because if I go to a basketball court right now, Esteban hasn't played a basketball game in a uniform, in a high school uniform in this city since 1997. If I go to a basketball court right now and say the name Esteban Weaver to a bunch of high schoolers who were not born in 1997, they're going to know who he is. And that who's to say that is not making it? Your name rings out in a city eternally. You've made it. Doesn't matter if you put on an NBA uniform, right? So this question of legacy is kind of being mirrored through this kind of um, material understanding of making it through, sure, a capitalistic lens, but also through this lens of just kind of merit of you've made it to the highest level that you can play at. Or this idea of making it where you are beloved in the place you were born and raised and played in, the courts that you helped build through your legacy, through your name. You are beloved by people who arrive to you through the stories of their parents. You are beloved through uncles telling their nephews and nieces about you on porches. That is, to me, making it. You're eternal in the place you love. That's, um, sure, you don't have a, there is, quote unquote, tragedy perhaps in not having an MBA contract or a, the kind of lifelong security that comes with what LeBron has been able to achieve in terms of financial success and all of this. But if we're talking legacy, legacy is simply the understanding that you are not going to live forever. And upon your not living forever, there will be a place or many places where you will be spoken about. And legacy is just kind of um, trying to crystallize the manner in which you are spoken about. And I think there's, there's a different definition of that, or there's a different approach to that than just saying you made the league. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I thought that was a beautiful um, reflection, especially as you um, looked at like Esteban Weber and I, I'm blanking, but there's another play, Kenny, Kenny Gregory. Gregory. Is that? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, in the book. And um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. And from my own lens, that person would probably be, he was a few years younger than me, um, but it would be Kyle Singler from. <laughs> Oh yeah, Oregon. Um, yeah, he played but, at Duke, right? Did he play at Duke. He played at Duke, and then he played in. He played for the Pistons, Pistons. and then the Thunder, and like, yeah. you know, kind of, you know. Um, but he, but he was also. I will say this about Kyle: like he, he's a good community member, right? And he, he comes back and he puts on tournaments and stuff like that every year, and he donates a lot to, you know, local organizations and stuff like that there. And so, um. You know, yeah, it, it's 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 similar in some respect, right? In that, like, for most of the world, a Kyle Singler basketball tournament at this point probably wouldn't be something that people would be like, "Oh, wow, that's you know." But for like Southern Oregon, that thing yeah. is still meaningful, you know. Um, and so, yeah. Um, so let's see what else. Um, So, you know, one of the things that's definitely there's there's a there's a discussion in the book um, that carries through really from beginning to end, as I as I would read it, um, that is about black childhood. It's about, yeah. um, you know, a, being a black boy, being a black teenager. There's this thing you talk about, about the difficulty that even you have. Um, and maybe this is related, maybe it isn't, but thinking about your friends and thinking about yourself as a child, um, right. you know, yeah. like visualizing yourself as, as a kid. Um, and, you know, obviously there's, there's a, there's a part of this that, um, is, I feel like in response to a lot of images and a lot of discussions about, you know, black teenagers, black young men, um, when both of us were growing up, not that they have gone away, but there was a particularly virulent strain of this in the 90s and early 2000s that people might associate with like, you know, Hillary Clinton saying super predators or Joe Biden's comments, you know, or yeah. whatever, right? Um, 
but um yeah and it, and and i mean you also have a very moving reflection on tamir rice you know in, in the book as well um and so yeah maybe say a little bit about kind of what what things about this that you wanted to address or debunk or dethrone or whatever? Yeah. Well, I think a lot about um, the borders of a neighborhood. You know, I, I grew up again in East Columbus in a all black area that was somewhat neglected by the city, but I grew up in an area that was also bordered by a very wealthy suburb. Right. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's my my life now is interesting because I live that that suburb uh, Bexley where I went to college for a bit. Um, it kind of sits in the middle of two black neighborhoods. So there's historically black neighborhood I live in now, Bronzeville in Columbus, and then there's kind of a far the far east neighborhood I grew up in. And these are just it, it's just a matter of a couple mi a few miles. You know, it's a it's a very literal. You cross the tracks and something's different kind of thing. Like you cross you you go through Bronzeville. And you cross underneath a, a a tunnel uh where the trains used to go and then you're like oh wait everything's a little nicer now <laughs> you know it's a nice there's like a hole there's like a market district and there's a nice ice cream shop and then you're in bexley for a little bit and then you cross again it's like wait a minute uh definitively different now <laughs> you know we're, we're back um and i think about how childhood reacted through those those borders for example my friends and i never felt dangerous we never felt threatening we never felt in, a, in the confines of our neighborhood, we were rarely treated as such. But if we were to say bike a bit further west into Bexley, we were instantly threatening. I mean, in a palpable way. Uh, people would look, you know, peek out of their curtains. You could see it. You know what I mean? And when I was young, that was never puzzling to me. I was I was really fortunate to grow up in a house with very revolutionary, politically aligned parents who were not afraid to just speak pretty plain um about the the state of uh the state of not just the the nation but the globe you know um i was thinking with gratitude recently i know this is slightly detouring but um i did like a, a um a writing workshop with one of the palestinian liberation groups here a couple weeks ago and i was talking about how south african apartheid was one of the first things i learned about because my mom had all these old buttons um, from her organizing that said like end apartheid now and I remember being like super young and just asking what that word meant I didn't know what the word apartheid meant and you know my mom and dad just like I don't remember how young I, I had to be like eight or nine they explained that shit to me like I was you know they expected me to they explained it in a way that a child would understand but they still were just like we're not gonna you know so I say all that to say I had a very sharp understanding of these dynamics at a very young age but that made it more baffling to me that there was a kind of danger that was projected upon me outside of the borders of my neighborhood where, you know, I, I grew up partially in an area that was that was nicknamed Uzi Alley, but it bears mentioning that no one in the neighborhood called it that, you know, that that name was thrust upon it by the police, by the gov by the city government, because it was supposed to say, this place is so dangerous, you have to stay out of it. And that place is a war zone and the people who live in it uh, should be treated as though they are constantly at war. And as I say in the book, if you are a powerful entity and you get to not only name the conditions of war, but determine where it happens, then you also get to identify and enact uh, a kind of apathetic harm to the people you believe live in these places. And that, for me, was a real jarring understanding that outside of the confines of this neighborhood that I loved, me and my young friends, even just on our bikes fucking around, um, were seen as dangerous. And I really do have, um, now to put this in a kind of more dreamlike sense, which I'm trying to approach in the book, there is a part of me that does feel like I look into the eyes of the people I love and I can't see them as younger than we are now, you know? And I think some of that is because I have a hard time. Part of this book is me trying to reach for the threads of my childhood and string together something that makes sense of the life I have right now. Because this isn't what I wanted for myself. 
I'm very grateful, obviously, but this isn't what I intended for myself. Um, you know, I remember the first time I was, the first time I got locked up, um, and I talk about this in the book, my brother coming to see me and having a moment where, um, you know, for folks who have done visits on the inside, you kind of know how the glass can be, and in some facilities, the glass can be this odd kind of reflective echo where, you know, like you're looking at yourself and you're looking at the person on the other side and, and the, the reflections just kind of replicate multiple times until they blend into each other. And I, that, that, that image trips me out to this day, you know, because I remember it was the first time I'd seen my brother look afraid while trying to not look afraid. And I remember that look he was giving me was trying, I think, to, I can't speak for him, but it seemed like he was trying to remember us as children, as somewhat innocent and childlike. I think about that all the time. I think about that particularly with my brother who, um, my niece just won the state tournament in basketball in Indiana, so proud of her. And uh, that required me going to a lot of games. You know, I was like going out there every weekend, every other weekend. And it was so cool. It, it, and I get, um, I get very emotional thinking about this. It was so cool to just watch my brother be, it has been so cool to watch him be this just like relentless sports dad. Um, but it was so cool to watch him in that state tournament moment, just like in awe of what he was watching his daughter do. And, you know, I could see this, that same look in his face where he was thinking like, wow, she was just, she was just a kid. And I was looking at him like, no, nah, man, like we were, we were just kids. And I, he's maybe one of the only people I can look at and visualize as a child in, in my whole life. And I think it's because of the childhood that we had together where we just, we fought each other a lot, but it was by way of looking out for each other. There was a protectiveness that when I think about that first time I was inside um, and him kind of looking at me through the glass, it was him perhaps reckoning with a failure to protect me from myself. And so that's a part of what I was trying to get at is, is um, I look at the people I've loved for a long time and sometimes their features blur into various versions of older selves they have not gotten to yet, but rarely does it blur into their younger selves. And I, I, I wonder if that's just a simple affect of, you know, me almost attempting to erase every version of myself that did not want to survive. And so my memory perhaps begins at age 25 in a day, you know? Um, and so that's a long and perhaps very emotional answer, but I think that's kind of where I'm at. I appreciate it. I mean, you know, that, um, that particular moment in the book where you're talking about um, what you just described in terms of seeing your brother through the glass um, was, I mean, I'll be honest, there's a couple times in the book reading it where I cried, you know, because it was like so moving and it was combined with, um, I think, all the effect that I have about what's going on in Gaza right now, too, where like even though it's totally different <laughs> worlds and discussions, right. like yeah. the affect sort of combined into this place of like, I just need to break down, you know, for a few minutes. Um, and so I part of the reason I mean. One, I, I, you know, I didn't know how much we wanted to get into the nuts and bolts, as I said to you before we started, because I recognize the book's not out in the world yet. And I do want to encourage people to get it. And I'm sure that they they will listening to this. Um, but also, you know, I was like, I don't know if I have the emotional fortitude to ask you about this specific thing, but it, it was incredibly honey, if the way you wrote that was just so beautiful, you know, right. um, and um uh, so how are you on time? Because there's a couple other things that we could do, but I yeah, want to be conscious. Of I got that. like 20 minutes. Okay. okay. Um, do you want to read anything at all? Oh, yeah, you did ask me to read some. Uh, <laughs> I forgot it's okay to if not, because I have other questions that we can get to, you know. Let's get to the questions. I forgot to bring my yeah. my little book with me. It's funny. I'm, yeah, yeah, uh, you're all right. Ramadan is Ramadan's around the corner and I'm prepping, which in my case means yeah. like getting up earlier and earlier <laughs> because I'm a runner. And so during Ramadan, I get up at like four in the morning and then run and then hide. And so I'm, I'm like doing my <laughs> my Ramadan prep, which means I'm getting up at like 5 a.m. and then groggily wandering, <laughs> wandering my house. So I forgot the book. But yeah, yeah, let's get it's all good. It's all good. Um, so Yasnin asks, I'm struggling to create Everything seems irrelevant when there is a genocide happening. I'm wondering if I should even try to overcome this and write. It's not really posed in a question, but, uh, you know, I, I thought it would yeah. be interesting to get your nah, reflection on it. I don't think anyone should attempt to overcome 
the horrors. I mean, if it, if it's not one, if it is not coming natural to you, one thing that's been important for me is um, actually not showing up as a writer. And and to be fair, I was a I was involved in political organizing before I even wrote anything in this city, you know. And so that's kind of trained me in a different way to, you know, I get asks from people like, oh, will you contribute a poem to this fundraiser or will you come and contribute a poem to this anthology for for Gaza? And um, I, I'm, I respect that work. I do. Um, I don't think that the best way I can show up is as a producer of, that's for me, the solidarity practices I'm interested in. I don't think, I, I wanna be careful how I word this. For me, that would be too much centering of myself, um, which I think operates against the modes of solidarity that I am interested in showing. But this isn't just for, for this moment. I mean, and people in Columbus know this. When I get asked to show up and read at actions and stuff, I never read my own work. I usually bring some June Jordan or I bring Arsali Skirmai or I bring Diane De Prima. You know, I, I'm not under no illusions of what my work is attempting to do, which isn't to say, of course, there are my politics are embedded in my work for sure. But I'm not actually writing things like all apologies to the people in Lebanon, like June, June Jordan. Um, my so to answer the question shortly i don't think anyone should be fighting to overcome this in right i think our our fight to overcome the horrors that we're witnessing need to for me at least i can't speak for everyone i'm trying really hard to not speak for everyone um for me the overcoming is how can i overcome this to get out of the house and put myself to use in a way that is not the production of work um you know i haven't written a whole lot uh and you know i'm i'm different you know I'm, I'm somewhat uh i write very quickly and easily when when the language is there for me i think um but of course i'm like preparing for a book tour and i'm preparing all this but uh i'm also not attempting to overcome this what we're i mean with straight up like every day um I actually don't think the horrors are increasing. I think they're they're just like they're uh, accumulating, you know. And it would be a betrayal for me to pretend as though there is a normal I can get back to. There hasn't been for a long time. I will say. I mean, for me, um, I'm operating almost always in a sense of even when writing this book. You know, I'm, I'm always operating in a sense of um, the world outside is not tenable and the degree to which it's untenable i think just accelerates sometimes and so no i, I don't think the overcoming does not need to be to write now of course if the writing is coming natural sure but um no one should feel guilt for not producing in a moment like this i don't think no one should feel guilt no one who is deeply feeling and yeah, no one who, you know how many people are just moving through the world as though nothing is happening? That is, that is, I know. Guilt. that's the guilt. Those people should feel guilt. Um, and I haven't talked about that a lot because I don't, uh, for me, my focus is on how can I be in solidarity with people who are already here? You know, I'm not really trying to drag people who don't give a fuck. I, I know that that is important work and I know that that work can, can have some success rate. I just, I don't have it. I don't have it in me. But what I'm saying is there are people moving around the world like ain't shit going on. And those that is where those people need to overcome some things within themselves. And I am not confident by now. I'm not confident that they will. You, writer, who is deeply feeling and due to that deeply feeling impulse feels stuck in your creative practice. There's no guilt there. You've already unlocked the, you know, you are by virtue of being a creative person. Uh, your, your deeply feeling impulses will serve your creativity when the time is right for them to serve your creativity. And in the meantime, your deeply feeling impulses will serve you by being in solidarity in a material way, however you can, wherever you're at. Right on, yeah. Matt Deich talks about uh, being at a teach-in for Palestine. One speaker was a Palestinian professor of history who survived the Nakba and taught at UTC for 40 years. He said, if he could do it all again, he would have studied poetry instead. 
I would love to hear Hanif's reflections on this sentiment. He said this after including a Darwish poem in his teaching, but the idea that he could best serve his people in liberation was poetry. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I am personally, well, I am skeptical of art itself on its own being a liberation practice. But, I mean, and I was, last time I was on here, I talked about, I talked about Enemy of the Sun and read a bit from Enemy of the Sun. And, um, you know, I talked about Riyadh Awad and, and the musicians who were making music in Palestine. So I do think that art has a purpose in a liberation practice because art is the archive, right? To say that, okay, I have this, I have this anthology of Palestinian liberation poetry that came out in the 1970s. So that suggests that there were Palestinian Palestinian liberation struggles happening in the 1970s. And there's an archive of what those look like. To say Riyad Awad made that Intifada record during the first Intifada that is straight up just like field recordings. It's, and there's a whole genre of that. There's a whole genre of, of Palestinian um, folks making essentially field recordings. That's an archive. And so just to study poetry aids in an approach towards liberation for me, because there are poets. This is why um, I know I just said I try not to get on people for being silent because I'm trying to focus on the people who are not. But I do think this is why there is a lot of frustration in the poets who have been silent, you know, because, I mean, if you want to talk about um, combat preparedness, however we define combat, you know, be it very literal or internal or just the building of power. Um, that happens by understanding the material conditions of the people who are were enduring oppression oppression. You know, like for to go through like the shifty records archive of South African musicians who are making records during apartheid. And a lot of those are some of those records are are spoken word records, you know, folks who are, and that's just kind of a plain archive of poetics of what it is like to um be harassed for not having your passbook you know what i mean that's important it's important to have now granted i don't think that for me especially understanding what my poems are doing my poems are not attempting um yeah i i don't think i, I can't write a poem and be like i've liberated a people today but i i do read my understanding, I have a very clear understanding of some of the perhaps struggles against gentrification in the Bay Area, for example, by reading Diane de Prima's work, right? So Enemy of the Sun was so informative for me. Um, I mean, I talked about on the show like years ago when I first got it. And I was, you know, learning about the history of Palestinian struggle. It was so important for me to say, oh shit, like, I mean, Darish was one of them. Like these poets were writing towards, um, a prayer for liberation even in the 70s in the 60s and you know in, in the 50s you know beyond 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 so i do think the study of poetics is um as in some ways as vital as the study of theory or these other studies that that aid us in our in our liberation struggles because poets are um you know essentially they're they're archivists of, an, of a real time moment and so I'm not great, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert in theory. Of course I read it, but I'm not an expert. When I, I mentioned this last time I was on here, like what I know is how art has impacted social movements throughout history. And um, that is, I turn to poems, I turn to songs, I turn to visual art because that's where the archive is. Yeah, yeah. Well, in a few, I think next week we're gonna have, I have to get it up on the site, but we're gonna have Wendy Trevino on oh, and man. um yeah i love wendy too and um she's one of the people she's she i'll be really interested to hear her talk about this specifically because she has a lot of criticism for um just the folks who are kind of like constantly like my art is is resistance yeah etc cetera, yeah. et cetera. and it's like um it's challenging like it's a it's a complicated thing but i think some of it has to do with like like you say like it's certain phases there's a struggle and that struggle informs the art and then the art is an archive of it and the art sometimes right. even like pushes like i think about like daruba ben wahad talking about gwendolyn brooks right like you know there there is this this aspect um this relationship and all revolutionary movements or liberation movements have 
like a beautiful archive of art and that that is both informed by them but also in certain ways um you know can can be powerful and i mean you, we could talk about freedom songs and things like yep. that right you know um yeah. but um you know it is like also one of those things that like can't be forced it can't be like you know i step into this thing and I'm going to write this and this is going to be my, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to spark the revolution with this poem, you know, like this kind of, uh, you know, thing, like, um, it has to be, I think a really organic relationship to, um, you know, to struggle and like, you know, and, and it's not everybody's thing to do either. Right. right. Like, as you said, like, you know, you, you got to think about, you know, I mean, if you actually, yeah, anyway, anyway, I don't want to think too much. It's important yeah. Also, to be clear for the artists and for all of us, if not now, then when? I, I will say that this time is long past, but now I think it's especially time to be clear on what bravery is. It's no longer, you know, I saw someone in no disrespect to this approach, but I saw someone being like, you know, it's 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 a brave position to speak up uh, in, in solidarity with Palestine because, and I don't want to diminish the fact that there are people who have been materially punished for it's for for decades for you know there's entire texts about the, the the liberal limits of the imagination when it comes to palestine but i also want to say that um one there is for me there is no bravery in righteousness this is a it is a righteous for me is plainly a righteous position to say if just at a starting point i don't believe people should live under occupation this is a baseline point that's that is in i don't believe that a righteous position is brave when taken in solidarity with an oppressed people because i am taking this position from a home that is not under siege with working internet connection in a comfortable you know what i mean like so i want to be clear on what bravery is for me um even while honoring the fact that people have been you know what i mean like uh there have been people who have lost things for for speaking up against palestine for or not against for speaking up speaking up for palestine right um but i i don't believe that there are material sacrifices that to me align with taking a position that is righteous in a position that is righteous when taken in solidarity with a besieged immensely suffering people when that position is taken by a people in the west in the imperial core so to speak who are not suffering to that degree or any degree close to it then i think we actually need to be clear on what bravery is and is not and what sacrifice is and is not and um so i for me i can't sit back and say my art is resistance i'm not really uh you know and to be clear on what my art you know like a lot if i'm being real like a, a lot of my poems i'm just writing little you know like poems about heartbreak and death in my mom, you know what I mean? And so um, I love the work that I do and I appreciate the work that I do. And, and definitely my politics are imbued in the work that I do, but it would be a real betrayal of the resistance practices that I know and understand have been engaged in if I were to write a poem in my house and be like, I did it, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. And I, as somebody who deeply appreciates your work, I, I also understand that, you know, that distinction, you know? Um, all right, we're going to wrap up in a second. I'm going to ask one more question um, because I did really appreciate. Um, there's a section on tanking uh, <laughs> as NBA teams, um, yeah. and there's a section on just what it means to be a fan of a team that is not the Lakers, is not the Celtics, is not the Yankees, like is not a team that is defined by you know, 26 championships or whatever it is. Right. Um, but a team that maybe if you're lucky, like once every 50 years or so, you'll, you might get a championship. Maybe you won't, maybe you'll get to a finals. Um, you know, and I say this partly because this is the story of basically all of my, um, you know, my favorite teams growing up. I mean, yeah my father was a Boston Red Sox fan. And so like, he likes to tell people that my first memory was him calling me down to watch the Red Sox win the world series in 1986. And the moment that he called me down, the ball rolls through Bill Buckner's just, legs yeah. and he breaks down crying, you know? Um, and so, you know, uh, 
but for me, mostly my 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 fandom obviously is the Portland Trailblazers. Growing up in Oregon, that's the only professional sports team. At you know now they have a soccer team too, but like when I was little, they didn't. Um, you know, and so that yeah, I don't know. You 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 have a line that just says can't explain it to anyone who hasn't spent a large portion of their life betting on losing teams, and. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything about yeah. that, but th that I, I personally connected with that whole section. Yeah, well, I'll say two things. I know you're in Philly now, and I, I will say this now because I won't say it in Philly. I said this to a, a pal of mine who's a Philly sports fan, and, and she got uh, and it was at a table with Philly sports fans. and they got it. But but I want to say I think to talk about tanking in the process specifically, I think it's. I get that sports is a championship. That's a business. You win a championship, but there's only one championship. There's only one championship, and a lot of teams are trying to win it. And the point I was trying to make to my Philly homies is like the process worked. It, by by definition, the process worked. The Sixers went from a hopeless team to a team that engineered itself to being one, one literal once in a lifetime shot away from the Eastern Conference Finals. An Eastern Conference Final, I think they would have won. That shot, that Kawhi Leonard shot does not go. I think if you run that play 10 more times, that shot's not going in. That shot barely, you know, almost didn't go in the, the normal time. And that shot, no one in the world could make that shot, you know? So to me, by definition, and I know that perhaps one could argue that the pro as long as Joel Embiid is in Philadelphia, the process era is still ongoing. But I think it's reached its kind of crescendo. And I love Joel Embiid, um, but I don't think that there is a, I don't think there's going to be a better Philly team than that one that Toronto beat. Um, but in my mind, the process worked. And I know that Philly fans, if some are watching this, are probably like grumbling and understandably so. Um, I think Philly fans, I actually love the Philly sports fan because there's a pessimism that I yeah. just I, I adore. One of my favorite sports tweets of the year and perhaps all time was uh, the writer Lindsay Zolads was watching. I don't I think the Eagle I didn't watch. The, I don't watch the NFL much anymore, but I think the Eagles were playing the Buccaneers in the playoffs and Lindsay tweeted go birds and then five minutes later in the thread she tweeted it's over <laughs> and I was like that's that's kind of the philly sports ethos um so i love a philly sports fan for their uh their eternal pessimism and the blazers are in an interesting spot right now because i you know they're not entirely hopeless um but things are a bit a mess you know and it just feels like it's going to be a mess for a minute uh mm -hmm. assuming I still believe that there's a future for Scoot Henderson to pan out. I really do. I just think the tools are there. The jump shot needs to come around. I know that that is, uh, <laughs> you know, saying the jump shot needs to come around is kind of like saying, you know, the house burned down, but, you know, at least one of the beams is still standing. You know, the, the jump shot, you need the jump shot in, in his case. But if, if it comes around, I think there's a future. I just, but I look at that team, I just, it's like a bunch of guys. There are a bunch of, there's some teams in the NBA right now more than in past years where I look at the rosters and I'm just like, that's just some guys, you know, the Orlando magic are making that work. You know, that's just some guys and it's kind of working, but the blazers, it's like, this is just a bunch of fucking guys like Deandre Ayton. It's just not there for me. Like, I just don't see it. And I like Jeremy Grant, but maybe not in that role. And Anthony Simons is probably just what he is now, you know? And so there's these questions that I te think teams have to make. I think that I'm not a, there's, I, I don't take a moral high ground on tanking. I just don't. I think that if you have a chance, and this is not the draft for that. This is not like the 03 draft or even last year's draft. But if you have a chance to get a generation, generational defining talent, as the Cavs did when LeBron was coming out, then I, I think you, I don't know. I don't like talking about sports in terms of who's owed anything. But for lack of a better term, I think you maybe owe it to your fans to put yourself in the position to attain that if there is nothing else on the horizon. I watched so many Timberwolves teams, so many, take this fucking moral high ground on tanking and just end up in 10th and 11th place in the West every single year. Those Rubio Kevin Love teams that just didn't have anything saying, we're not going to tank because we're going to do this the right way. You don't have the talent to do it the right way. <laughs> you don't have the ability to do it the right way. And all that means is you're going to end up with the fifth or sixth pick in a lot of drafts where you needed to have the top three pick. And that acted as a, for me, that felt like a betrayal to the commitment that fans made year in and year out in, in putting a belief in this team. And it led to a lot of fucked up drafts for the Timberwolves, you know, quite frankly. Um, and I, so I think 
if you are, say, the Blazers, there are some teams that are right now in the NBA that are so bad they don't have a choice. Like the Wizards cannot win games. So it's not even tanking at this point. They just literally cannot win games. Um, but you really, I think, owe it to to a fan base to put some hope into, you know, these fan bases too. I I, I know so many Pistons fans, for example, who love that team so much, who when that team was losing 15 games in a row were still showing up because Detroit, I, I love Detroit so much in that city. That city loves its sports teams. And, you know, yeah, I don't really watch the NFL anymore, but I got, God, I was rooting for the Lions. I was so, I was rooting for the Lions so incredibly because I know so many fans who just suffered for decades. And we turn to sports, or I turn to sports because I am hopeful for a miracle against all odds. The Timberwolves have been bad for my whole adult life, pretty much. And the fact that they are, they lost a really ugly game last night, yesterday, but still, the fact that they are a top team in the West right now is so improbable to me. And it's so miraculous to me. And I'll remember this season for, the, I don't, I mean, if they even win one playoff series, I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And they might win one playoff series this year and then have 20 more years of shit luck. And I st I'll still remember this. The Columbus Crew, my hometown soccer team, who I adore, won another championship last, last year. And I will remember that day. I was like crying in the stands. You know what I mean? And sports are fleeting and foolish in some ways. And we all know that the corporate level of sports is riddled with problems and every team is owned by a horrible fucking person. Um, and yet it is something that I turn to um, for a kind of improbability that fuels the romanticism that which, you know, I think I'm a cynic and a romantic in equal equal measure. And I think the romanticism that sports offers rubs up against my cynicism in a way that creates a really beautiful alignment. And uh, yeah, I, I hope the Blazers. I don't know. I don't know what I hope for them. I hope I hope the jump shot comes around for Scoot Henderson. <laughs> Yeah, and and Shaden Sharp gets healthy. I mean, I'll, I'll say for a Blazers fan, my take on it just quickly. I know people, nobody cares about this except for the two of us, but I'll say that um, my hope is that part of the problem for the Blazers, in my view, over, since the Rashid Wallace, Scottie Pippen, you know, era, where they were really close, also in that era, to getting to the finals and probably would have won that year, um, you know. Or I grew up as a, you know, I have a Jerome Kersey jersey on and Clyde Drexler and that team was, you know, if not for Michael Jordan and the bad boys, then they could have won a championship too. Um, but part of the problem is that they haven't actually bottomed out. They haven't, they don't actually have a history of like tanking, right. of, of actually like saying, you know what, um, like when they got Dame, it was after like one bad season and he brought them right back into contention his rookie year. And it actually hurt the team long term that they didn't have more guys in his, you know, generation of players that they could build a core around because and this is a reality, unfortunately, for small market teams is that it is very hard. I mean, Cleveland is a tough place to attract free yep. agency. You know, that's one of the difficulties LeBron had when he was there, especially the first um, cycle. Um you know, uh, Minnesota is difficult to attract people for free agency and Portland, it, like making the case to NBA players like, hey, you should go live in this, you know, relatively small town in the Pacific Northwest is a difficult case to make, you know. And so our hope is attached to the draft ultimately. And that, you know, so it is it is a lottery thing, right? It is a like, uh, you know, a, you know, I'm going to wish and hope on this team and hope that like kind of the long odds work, you know, over a, a period of 30, 40 years that we win. And so, yeah, for my, for the Blazers right now, my take is like, they should be bad each of the next couple of years. And yeah. then hopefully they'll have accumulated enough between yeah. the picks that they have and that they trade for that they can build a good foundation around their young players. But yeah, it's Scoot does need to learn to shoot a little bit better. <laughs> I've actually been very encouraged by his season on the whole, despite the fact that he has not shot the ball well. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah. yeah. He looks good. Um, well, he looks okay. Anyway. Yeah, he looks okay. He has, a, yeah. Anyway, much appreciated. Um, this has been wonderful. I really do genuinely encourage everybody to buy this book, even if you 
um, don't care about basketball at all. I honestly don't think that will matter one bit in terms of folks enjoying it and getting a lot out of it. Um, there's a lot of things we didn't talk about in the book. Um, you know, I think there's like an interesting kind of even rumination on abolition in a different kind of way than people often talk about it that's embedded in the book too. Um, but, you know, I, I really think it's it's a beautiful book. And I also think if you are a basketball fan that you will love it, um, you know, and and yeah, I can totally see the the romanticism and the cynicism, right? Like that's, the, the, those are both, you know, yeah. both there. It's, it's a very romantic book in a lot of ways. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And anyway, man, I, I always enjoy talking to you. It's it's a real there's a lot of people that, you know, I have a lot of friends and people that I enjoy having conversations with. And you were at the very top tier of those folks. And so um, I appreciate that. No, I appreciate you as always. I, it's always a thrill to get to do this with you. And I, I appreciate your support. And I also, as always, I appreciate millennials are killing capitalism. I appreciate the way y'all push the culture in terms of thinking about um a political framework that I align with in, in numerous ways that I don't think of on my own. So I appreciate that. All right, man. Peace. All right, y'all. All right, everybody. Have a good one.